<laughs> Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. If you're a dad in the room, just raise your hand real fast. High five every single one of you. Way to go. Happy Father's Day. My name is Kenny Barr. I'm one of the pastors here at North Church. And like Pastor Nate said, we're doing God's redemption story. And you may be new here. And you might be saying, listen, Kenny, what is God's redemption story? Well, I'm glad you asked. About nine or nine and a half months ago, sometime in September, we really felt as a church, um, culturally, people are less and less biblically illiterate now these days. Meaning they don't even know maybe how to read the Bible. They don't understand the different narratives of the Bible. They don't understand really all the stories of the Bible and how they all correlate towards God's redemption plan. And so we decided as a church that we wanted to know this, and we wanted everybody to know this. We took an 18-month journey, well, we're in an 18-month journey, to say, let's look at God's overarching plan of how he's going to redeem his people. And so we spent nine months in the Old Testament, and two weeks ago we ended that, and we are now in the New Testament, what we call season four. Now, God's redemption plan is pretty cool, but it's even cooler when you add seasons to it because it sounds like a Netflix documentary. <laughs> so you're welcome. We're in season four right now. And what we're doing is we're looking at the Gospels. And we're taking a look and saying, hey, what are stories in the Gospels that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Because we feel like if this story happens in every single one, that's pretty important. Would you agree? Turn to your neighbor and say, I agree with Pastor Kenny, like always. Okay. And so last week, Pastor Nate got up here, and he talked about Jesus' baptism. And today, we're going to be talking about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this, fun fact, is the only miracle that shows up in all four Gospels. Only miracle. So you're welcome today. You're in for a treat. Um, the other thing we're going to do here today is we're going to look at this story through the lens of each Gospel as we tell the story. So we're going to look at it in Mark, uh, let's see, Mark, John, Luke, and Matthew. And as we do that, you have to understand that each gospel writer um, is telling the gospel to a certain group of people. That's their audience. For instance, Luke, he is writing to a predominantly non-Jewish audience, Gentiles, people that are not a part of the Jewish people. Uh, Matthew, though, however, is talking to a Jewish audience. He's speaking to them saying, listen, this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. And then Mark is talking about, uh, he's specifically talking to Roman believers or Gentiles, people that weren't a part of the Jewish faith, who have converted to Christianity. And so I tell you this because as we look through each gospel and look at this story as we walk through it, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, okay? Sound good? Turn to your neighbor and say, let's get started already. Okay? Now, we're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 32. It says, So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them, Jesus and the disciples, leaving, recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a cr large crowd, he had compassion on them. That's going to be important. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. Now, other gospels will say desolate place. That's also, keep that in mind. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. So the people, send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat, okay? So here's the story, okay? Jesus is, different gospels have a reason why, but Jesus retreats away to what is called a desolate place, and all these people here, Jesus is over there. And we're going to find out later, it's 5,000 men, upwards to 15,000 people, go to him. And it says that Jesus has compassion for him. And that word compassion for them is a ridiculously long Greek word that I cannot pronounce for you today. Um, but what it means is 
it's um, like from your bowels or your gut. Meaning, this isn't like when you get a flat tire or you know somebody gets a flat tire and you're like, that's a bummer. See you later, right? This isn't if you go shopping at Winco and you forgot your debit card and all you have is a credit card. Okay, it's not like, oh, this is unfortunate or that's a bummer, right? Jesus is speaking from inside like his soul saying, this is my people. They're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. His compassion for them is deep. And then the authors also write about how they say, listen, this is a remote place or a desolate place. Now that Greek word, I can almost pronounce. It's eromos. And the thing that translates into is wilderness. And so Jesus, in the wilderness, sees a group of people that are lost, and he finds compassion for them. Now, like I said, as a church, we've been going through uh, the whole Bible. So for nine months, we spent in the Old Testament. Let's see if it worked, okay? Can you tell me? Oh, goodness gracious, I'm nervous right now. Can you tell me another story in the Bible where a group of Israelites left one place and they found themselves in the the desert or the wilderness. Exodus, raise your hand if you said it. You're smart, you're smart. Some of you aren't, okay? You need to go back and watch the whole God's Redemption series. Yes, the Exodus. That's back when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and God led them through Moses into the wilderness. And Moses then, you know, God, through Moses, gives them water and food when they were lost. And then guides them, as their leader guides them to the promised land. What the authors of each one of these gospels are trying to present right now is, is that Jesus is going to be like Moses, a prophet who leads his people. Now, we know as followers of Jesus that Jesus is much more than just a prophet. He is the Messiah. But he's also like God who looks down on his people with compassion. He says, I recognize you're lost. And I'm here to help you. I'm here to guide you. Now, one of the things I love about the Bible very often is that we see that this is how God interacted with his people in the Old Testament. We now see that God is doing the same thing in the New Testament through Jesus. I can't help but think, does God still do this today? Is there chances that, now, listen, we live in Spokane, Washington. Mm, Thank you, right? You are not in the wilderness, okay? I'm just going to let you in on that right here, right now. You might be online. I don't know. Maybe you are in the desert. I don't know, right? But there is grocery stores right down the street, okay? But here's, there's a reality, though, is sometimes when you read Scripture and you're asking God to speak to you, you might be looking at this and saying, well, I don't have a physical hunger, But I do can relate sometimes to feeling lost. I can sometimes relate to feeling like I'm all alone. And there are times I'm looking to God and saying, could you please show compassion on me? Can you please shine your light on me? Because although I can't really understand being in the desert and needing food, I can understand the likes of saying, God, I need you right now. I need you because I'm lost in my finances. And I feel so trapped and so hung up that, God, I just need your compassion right now. That, God, I am struggling with this purpose and direction for my life right now. And I feel lost. And I need your voice in my life right now to show me the way. And what's great about that is, you know what? Um, I speak with a lot of young and um, older people. You know who you are, okay? I'll let you decide if you're in that category or not. But a lot of young people, especially who are are in college or getting out of college, are finding this spot where they're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know the direction to go in. I I don't know what my next step is. I'm lost. God, help me. I, I, I need your compassion right now. I need you to see me. And then oftentimes, people that maybe are empty nesters now or they're a little farther in life, 
are also asking the same question. God, now my, my kids are moved on out of the house. What do I do? How, what, what's my next step? How do I need it? And we're often asking ourselves, God, show me this compassion that you show to these Israelites. So the question I want you to ask in your mind right now is this, is where in your life do you feel like you're in the wilderness and you need God's compassion on you? You need him to shine this light. Maybe it's broken relationships. Maybe it's work. Wherever it is, hold on to that in your mind. So we're going to continue the story as we look in John. Now John writes, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people? He asked this only to test him, for he already knew what he was going to do. Poor, poor Philip, poor Philip. You were doomed from the beginning. Philip answered him, I would take, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each person to have one bite. I'll be honest, when I first read this, I go, poor, poor Philip. Oh, man. Have you guys ever had this where you have maybe a parent, a sibling, a boss, a teacher, somebody in your life who asks you a question, but they know the answer already? Right? Nobody. Awesome. Great. This is a great crowd. Um, you know what I mean? Where they ask you a question, but you could tell they know the answer, and then you start freaking out a little bit like, I need to answer it how they want me to answer it. So you're like, okay, um, hmm, all right, let's figure out how to do this. I feel bad for Philip because I'm like, man, Philip, like, whew, you're being tested right now. But on the other level, this is actually a pretty common practice that for Pharisees and teachers of the law in this day, when they had disciples, people that were um, following them to learn from them, oftentimes what they would do is ask them questions to test them. Now, we all in here have had teachers, parents, somebody in our life, maybe even a coach. A test isn't just to say, ha, 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 watch you suffer. It's to help them grow. It's to help them get better. And I think right now what ends up happening is Jesus is asking Philip a question in order to help him grow. Well, Philip does what Philip knows how he would do to answer this question. He sees a group of 15,000 people, and he goes, goodness gracious, um, how would I solve this? So he thinks, well, I think we would have to work, but we would have to work for a half a year just to have enough food for somebody to have a bite. And what's interesting to me is that Philip up until this point has seen Jesus do miracles. He's seen it. Philip has seen Jesus go to a wedding and turn water into wine. He's seen a lady at a well, and he knows things about her that he shouldn't have known. I mean, according to Scripture, there's over, over 5,000 miracles that has happened. So most likely, Philip has seen multiple miracles, even if they're not recorded by now. But he still answers in the way how he thinks and how he knows it to be solved. It's a little surprising that Philip doesn't go, hey, just like you turned water to wine, there's some rocks on the ground, turn rocks to bread. I feel like that's pretty easy for you, Jesus. But he doesn't do that. And I often, like, at one point want to criticize Philip, but at the other end I go, well, I, I get it, because I do the same thing. When I hit an issue in my own life or a problem in my life, my first reaction isn't just to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've seen you do miracles. Help me through this. It's usually to go, okay, how am I going to get this done? How am I going to solve this? How am I going to figure this out? How am I going to deal with this relationship? Now, many of you know this, but I have a daughter. Uh, her name is Zoe. She's six years old. She's the most adorable thing that you're ever going to lay your eyes on, Okay. And uh, last year, she got a bike. And uh, one of the things I love about our church is just how much they love Zoe and how much they care for her and our kids' ministry cares for them. And I just love it. And so I got this bike, and I was like, hey, we're going to go learn how to ride a bike today. And so I took her to um, where I got, I, I took this motorcycle class. And so I took her to that. It's this big flat parking lot with lines on the ground. And I was like, this is going to be perfect. 
So I said, Zoe, we're going to learn how to bike. After about an hour, I realized she's struggling pretty good. Um, it's one of those bikes, you know, where, you know, if you pedal backwards, it stops. Um, she fell off it a couple times, which I didn't know was possible on training wheels. So, like, it didn't go great. And after, like, an hour, she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I went full dad mode, right? If you're a dad in this room, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We don't quit anything in this family. <laughs> you will be on this bike for the next six hours. You're not giving up. And I'm trying to show her how to, like, I'm doing the whole, like, put my hand on the seat. We're going to do this. It's okay. Just pedal. Turn. Oh, oh my goodness. It's not working. <laughs> right? And at one point, she gets so frustrated. She goes, I'm done. And, and I'm like, you're so stubborn. You, you get that from your mom. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> right? <laughs> clearly. Well, like, a, a couple weeks later, I started noticing at home she was getting on the bike and trying to teach herself. And on one hand, it's adorable, like you're still trying, you're this. And on the other hand, it's incredibly frustrating as a dad. I want to help you. I know how to ride a bike. I'm quite good at it, I think. Let me help you do this. Let me help you figure it out. And I'm, I'm almost getting frustrated. Just let me be a part of the process here. You don't know something, but I do. Let me help you. I often think God's in that same spot with us. Here's a problem that we have. And, and he's up there saying, let me help you. Tr do you trust me? Do you trust me with your finances? Do you trust me in this hard spot at work? Do you trust me with purpose and direction in your life? Do you trust me with this broken relationship? Or are you going to go try to figure it out yourself? Will you trust me today? Will you trust that I am with you and guiding you and being with you and walking with you? Or are you going to try to figure this out by yourself? Because I often believe that Jesus and God test us in these moments. Or moments of a problem of saying, there's 15,000 people here, Jesus. How are we going to feed them all? Jesus is going, do you trust me that we'll get it done? Do you trust me with your life? Do you really? Or are you going to constantly try to fix it yourself and be with yourself? And so at this moment, uh, what I love about this story, because we're going to get to the part where the miracle happens, but in this part of the story, um, the, like I said, the gospel writers have one point where they're trying to show us Jesus is like Moses. He's there for compassion and whatnot. But then the story goes from Jesus trying to serve everybody, and it, and it changes now a little bit, where he's going to specifically talk to his disciples, right? So he goes from, I'm, I'm kind of speaking, and we're going to solve this problem, but I'm also going to help my disciples and, and test them to help them grow. And what I think oftentimes in, in our lives is that if we try to solve things ourselves and we try to miss the test, we're going to miss out on God's miracles in our life. If we decide, God, I'm going to solve it this way, and I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to handle this situation this way, and I'm not going to include you, you're going to miss out on Jesus' miracle in your own life. And so, um, so, so Philip goes, so Jesus says something. I'm going to say it here in a second. But the story then begins to change a little bit. And the best way I can say it, this is where he starts instructing the disciples is uh, when I was a intern for our district office with our denomination in Puyallup, I met with this pastor one time and I was sitting down and I can't remember what I asked him specifically. It must have been something like, what's one piece of advice you would give a pastor one day or something like that. And he says, Kenny, listen, one day you're going to, if you're a pastor, you're going to have a decision to make. Is you, are you going to lead people to be on a cruise ship or a battleship? And I thought, duh, cruise ship, those are awesome. <laughs> Who doesn't want to go on a cruise? That's ridiculous. That's a dumb question, sir. <laughs> he goes, when you're on a cruise ship, everybody feeds you. Everybody takes care of you. And you're just along for the ride. And it's a fun ride. It's a good ride. But you watch other people work. When you become a disciple, meaning, when I say disciple, this is what I mean. 
Somebody that says, God, I'm no longer the Lord of my own life. God, I repent. I change my mind to, God, you are now the Lord of my life. And I believe that when your son, Jesus, died on the cross, his blood covers my sin. And I will be with you in heaven. But you are telling me the way. A disciple, the 12 disciples that are with Jesus, they, they're on mission. So now we're going to change the story a little bit, and we're going to look at it through a lens of, I am a disciple who is on mission. Let's read the rest of the story in, in Luke. They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go buy food for all this crowd. Um, now, other gospels are going to mention there's a boy who had the five loaves and two fish. Now, some people believe that this boy freely gave these five loaves of bread and two fish. I, on their hand, think the disciples are a bunch of thieves, okay? <laughs> you decide, okay? I'm going to leave that up to you. About 5,000 men were there. Again, most likely about 15,000. They only recorded the men. Most theologians believe there's probably somewhere around 12 to 20,000 people there. So we're going to go with the middle and say like 15 or 16, okay? But he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. The disciples did so. And everyone sat down, taking five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They ate, all ate until they were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces that were left over. One thing that's in all the Gospels is this one part in here that says Jesus received the five loaves of fish and, or the five loaves of bread and the two fish and he gave thanks to it. God, thank you for what you have given us. And then he distributes it. And one of the things I love is this creative miracle where everybody is fed until they are satisfied. One theologian writes this. Philip doesn't know what to do Andrew doesn't either, but Andrew brings the boy and his bread and fish to Jesus' attention. The point here is obvious, but perhaps we need to be reminded of it. So often we have no idea what to do. But a good starting point is always bring what we have to Jesus. You can never tell what he's going to do with it. Though part of the Christian walk is an expectation that he will do something. And it will probably be something we never thought of. I love that Andrew at this moment, what he could have done is he could have grabbed these five lists and two fish and go, this clearly isn't going to solve our problem. He's looking at 15,000 people. This isn't, I probably, it's not even worth mentioning to Jesus. It's not even worth saying, Jesus, hey, we have this five loaves because it's clearly not going to work. But he does. Hey, Jesus, here's what we got. And Jesus says, thank you. Thank you, God, for what we've given and, and does something amazing with it. I think oftentimes as disciples, when we're first walking out, like what do we do? Or maybe we've been walking for a long time and we forgot. The first step is just to give to Jesus what we have. Part of being on mission is just saying, God, here's what I have. If you grew up in church at any point, you probably heard like me this, this verse saying, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I can imagine the disciples going, this is a lot of people. How are we going to help them all? And Jesus goes, give me what you can. Give me what you have. As a disciple, how often are we giving to Jesus what we have? Saying, God, here's what I have to help. Now, for instance, um, again, I, uh, I used to be a youth pastor here at North Church. And I led our high school ministry. And I met this wonderful older lady um, after Rooted. And I said, listen, I think you'd just be an amazing small group leader for our high school girls. And she said, no. And that's the end of the story. Just kidding. <laughs> she said no. And I said, why not? And she says, listen, Kenny, I just had two high school girls graduate. They're in college. I know high school girls don't want to listen to me. <laughs> I have experience in that, right? I don't want to do this. And listen, I, don't even, I, I know high school girls need a lot of investment and care and help. And I just don't have that time or energy anymore. And she tells me this, and I go, okay, thank you. Um, it, do you have an hour or two on Wednesday night to just 
care about them? What do you mean? Just sit with them. Just hang out with them. Have fun with them. And she's like, okay. And I said, just do what you can. Do what you're able to do. And I watched, you guys. I watched for years this lady lead high school girls to Jesus. I watched her pray with girls on Wednesday night. I watched girls who come from broken, really bad homes and came to church saying, I need something. I'm lost. And Jesus, I need your compassion. And I watched her give that compassion like Jesus was using right, right through her. I watched her as I told her, we're doing this thing called Collide Camp. She said, oh my goodness gracious. And I said, listen, I agree, it's going to be hard. There's a lot of jumping at Clyde Camp. There's a lot of running at Clyde Camp. It's always like 100 degrees out. You need like a constant IV drip when you're at Clyde if you're an adult. Okay, and I looked at her and I said, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm worried for myself. I'm really worried about you. I watched her at Clyde Camp pray for high school girls that night. Was it hard? Oh, absolutely. But she just did what she could. And I watched God use her. Now, you'll notice in this story, Philip didn't do the miracle, right? He didn't perform the miracle. He just gave, here's this bread and fish that I stole, right? Use it, right? It's not our job to save people. It's not our job to go do this crazy miracle. But I think Jesus shows us through the disciples that our job is just to give them what we can. Here's what I have. God, I know my next step maybe is to trust you with my finances, but I don't feel like I have a lot, but I have 10 bucks. God, I don't know if I have a lot of time and energy to do all these different things and help people and whatnot, but I have an hour a month or an hour a week, whatever. It's just simply to say, God, here's what I have. Use it. There's a um, story that maybe many of you have heard of, uh, but probably some of you haven't. It's um, a friend of mine that goes to our church for a long time, John Loringer, and his wife, Glendy. Um, now, they went on a missions trip to Africa, and part of this missions trip to Africa was to give this village um, flip-flops. The reason they gave them flip-flops was because in this part of Africa, a lot of people were actually getting really sick and even dying because of the parasites that would enter in through their feet because they didn't have shoes. And so part of the mission trips was to deliver flip-flops to this village. Now, at this village, there were 600 people. And they um, kind of cut this deal with the Old Navy where they could bring 400. And part of that was VBS at the time here at North Church uh, took pictures, and kids wrote, and they put it with the flip-flops, with every single flip-flop. And uh, they put it in suitcases, and then they went to Africa, and... Uh, they got to this village knowing, I only have 400 flip-flops in a village of 600. We're not going to have enough for everybody. But they decided, we're just going to give out what we can. And so for hours, they're just matching kids with flip-flops, sending them away. Every kid's getting a picture of another kid from North Church and like a little prayer or something. And uh, they start doing this. Well, down the road, John sees another village coming towards them. They've heard what's happening. They've heard there's people here that are giving away flip-flops, and we need some. John looks, and he goes, we, there's no, we don't have enough for this village. There's no way we have enough for this other village coming here. And so he asked his friend that was helping distribute the sandals, how many sandals we got left? We got 40 on the ground, and we probably got one, and we only have one more suitcase in the back of the bus. Okay, we're going to give out as many as we can. So they start matching flip-flops. Hours go by. Every person in the village they went to in the next village got flip-flops. Here's the crazy part. Every person got a picture of a kid and a note from North Church. And there was way over 400. Might remind you of another story we're talking about today. Here's what I know. Is that when you as a disciple of Jesus Christ bring forth to God and say, here's what I have, God, please use it. You're allowing him to then say, I'm going to do a miracle in the people around you. What's my first step as a follower of believer or a believer and a follower of Jesus? It's to give Jesus what you have. You're in control, God. 
I follow you. I trust you. I believe in you. Here's what I have. Please use it as you will. And when we do that, we're going to see people come to know Jesus. I love, and I love the story where John, and we see this crazy miracle of all these kids, and I love this lady who helped high schoolers, because I think it's a real miracle any time in our culture someone decides that I'm no longer the Lord of my life and I choose to follow Jesus. We live in a culture that is very self, um, it's all about me, it's all about what I have, and very often are we not thinking of others. And any time someone decides to say yes to Jesus, I find that's a miracle. But what's most important is that we follow God and just by saying, God, here's what I have, please use it. What are you giving to God? What are you saying, God, here's what I have, please use it. And it's up to you, God, on if you make it a crazy miracle or if you use it and I don't see the fruits of it. But I give it to you. And so that's the story, right? That's the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is there's a problem, right? Uh, Jesus is in this remote place. Five, over 15,000 people come, right? They need, they're like, what should we do? We have to send all these people away. And then Jesus feeds them all. But I want to end with the book of Matthew. Because Matthew points out something I think is very important for all of us that are disciples here in the room and are online. Matthew points out that in the middle of this story, when all the disciples say, we need to send them away, we don't have the food for them. We have to send them to the countryside and villages. This is, listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replied in Matthew 14, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus said, bring them to me then. Can I tell you as a disciple, our job is bring them to Jesus. I think we have a real problem sometimes as disciples is we try to feed people with the bread we have and not the bread of Jesus. That we come across people very often who are hurt, who are broken, who are in pain. People that have addiction, people that have broken relationships, people that have lost somebody in their life. And as disciples, what we try to do is we try to help them. Here's the advice I want to give to you. Here's what I want to tell you what to do. And oftentimes when we do that, we're just giving them the bread from our own knowledge. And they're missing out on Jesus. Now, I know in Scripture it says, seek wise counsel. But I'm a firm believer that wise counsel is going to Jesus. How often is there times that we interact with somebody and we say, let's pray about this. You're hurting. You're suffering. I want to let you know Jesus sees you and you're lost. He sees that you need compassion. He sees that you are in the wilderness. And just like Jesus gave these people bread, just like God gave the Israelites bread in the Old Testament, he wants to help you. Let's pray together. Let's open up this Bible together. Let's seek Jesus together. And I think when we do that, we see God work through us in other people's lives. We see God move through us. And when something miraculous happens, when relationships are healed, when purpose and direction happens, it's not because of us. We recognize that's God and the Holy Spirit moving. Now, I get to work with um, a lot of amazing leaders here at North Church. People that teach classes, people that lead community groups, people that help shepherd lost sheep. But I met this one young couple after Rudin, and I said... You're, hope you're catching a common theme here. I ask people to do a lot of stuff here. I really think you would be really great rooted leaders, or at least a community group leader. Would you think about it? And we're sitting down for coffee, and, and I'm paraphrasing. They said, no. Why not? Kenny, they were a young couple, mid-20s, just got married. Kenny, we, we don't have a lot of life experience. If somebody's in our group that's been married for a long time we don't know how to help them i can't give them advice especially if they have kids 
Or what if they're really older in life and I can't help them with advice or whatever not? Also, I don't even know the Bible that well. I can't lead people. And I said, perfect. That's exactly why I think so. You recognize it. That means you have to bring them to Jesus. That means you have to say, hey, listen, I know you're suffering. I know you're hurting. Let's pray together. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to guide, I don't, I don't know what to say right now, but I do know somebody who says they are the bread of life, who says that if you eat from me, you will never go hungry again. You will be satisfied. And my favorite part of this story is Philip says, listen, we'd have to buy a, a bunch of bread and gosh, we wouldn't even have enough for everybody to have a bite. Jesus gives them enough bread until they are satisfied and they are left over. Jesus says, I have more than enough for you. I can feed you for a long, long time. And as disciples, our job is just to bring them there. Just to guide them and say, here's Jesus. Let's seek him together. So you might be in this room, and, and if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple in this room, you say, listen, I follow God. Maybe it's time to say, God, here's what I have. Use it. Maybe it's time to bring somebody to Jesus. I know a community group leader who told me recently, he said, listen, I started reading the Bible reading plan. I was really diving into it, and I felt God lead me to this old guy down the street who was working on a car. And I just asked him his name and we start chatting. And all I did was, hey man, our church is reading through the Bible. Would you want to ever read it with me? Maybe that's you in the room. What do I do right now? You bring them to Jesus. And maybe you're in the room and you're saying, I'm lost. And I need Jesus' compassion in my life. I, I don't want to try to solve this on my own. I need Jesus to speak in me. We have a prayer team every single Sunday. It's on this side and they're on this side. They have really awesome, amazing lanyards, right? And that's what their job is. I see you. Let's seek Jesus together. But it takes us to go to Jesus. It takes us to say, God, I need you. Please show compassion. Let's pray. Father, Lord Jesus, um, I'm guilty. I'm guilty for always wanting to try to solve my own problem. That when I feel lost, God, I don't seek your compassion. God, but I know you are up in heaven. And I know you love us and care for us. I know that because you sent your son to die on the cross so we could spend eternity with you. God, use what we have. It might be five loaves and two fish, God, but help it feed 15,000 plus people, God. Take what we have, our energy, our time, our money, God, and help feed the people here in Spokane and around the world. Show me and guide me, God, of how to bring people to you. God, because we want to see you move. We want to see you do amazing things, God, not just for us, but for other people. In your name, amen.